Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another virtual plant clinic with Dr. Bill Lester. <laughs> well, he's he's somewhere around. <laughs> he's he's he might be popping in and out. He's a busy man. He um, he's got another event going on in the same building where Bernie is, and he's trying to set that event up while he's going to be popping on here. Um, Colby is unable to join us because nothing to do with Colby, just Hernando County itself is having computer issues. So he's unable to join us. And so it's just us volunteers. I am Lily Browning, I guess. I guess am I a master gardener, Bernie? Hi there, folks. Yes. And we have Bernie, master gardener, Bernie. So I guess I'm, I'm, you know, just... I'm still a volunteer master gardener and all these virtual plant clinics I'm doing, you know, I think should count towards master gardener time. Do you get double time, Bernie, when you do master gardener <laughs> clinics? No, I don't. You're I... there available, yet you are multitasking by helping other people. I think you should get double time for that. Time and a half, at least. <laughs> I had a hard time getting credit for all my time. It, when, the, when they went to the new computer program, uh, the previous records weren't in computer. So I was short about uh, 3,000 hours for a long time. But I, I finally got them. Uh, been a very hectic morning, actually. I've, I've, I've been very busy and uh, uh, well, let had me... people with, with the, the standard run-of-the-mill problems, a, a couple of lawn problems, a fellow with... Uh, some avocado trees that are turning yellow, which brings me to uh, a subject I'd like to talk about for a little bit. Which okay, let me is, say good morning to Buddy first. Good morning, Buddy. Oh, <laughs> good morning, Buddy. Uh, soil test. The mm -hmm. uh, thing about the the fellow with the avocado trees is avocados were the leaves were turning yellow, and uh, that's fairly common. Uh, on a lot of plants, indicating that there are, there's a nutritional deficiency. And uh, so well, I have a copy of a plant and, and, or of a, a, a soil, soil test. test. And it, it shows the, the percentage of, of the elements in there and, and the nitrogen and the phosphorus and all that. And it's a tremendous amount of information. Costs 10 bucks. You know, you can't get anything for ten bucks anymore. A McDonald's and a drink. Yes, and you can't get that. a fast you can't get a fast food meal for ten bucks. No. no. So, uh, you know, the the big problem with uh, these nutritional things is you never know. Maybe the pH is so far out of whack that the plant can't accept the nutrients, or maybe it just needs some fertilizer, or maybe the, the, this is dirt that's been hauled in after the, they built your place just to, to level the, the ground out and and it's nothing that, that's usable for anything so the only way to tell that is to spend the 10 bucks you send this little sample off you go around and you, you take a little bucket and you, you take a couple of scoops out of one place and some scoops out of another and, you know take four or five samples shake it all up in the bucket take a little scoop and they give you an envelope, put the sample in the envelope, send it off to the university. University has this fantastic machine. They, they take your little sample, they, they put they it in. Water, with, don't they? Actually, it, it's called a Malik. They're using Malik 3 solution, which is, is a standard uh, for everybody in, in this industry that Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a very, very, very weak acid. Okay. And, and it, it takes the nutrients out of the soil and puts them into a liquid form. And then they take that and, and they have this, this machine that has a plasma, a, an electric arc thing that is at thousands of degrees, 5,000 degrees or something like that, uh, centigrade. Very, very hot. They put a drop of this liquid in and it changes color and by looking at all the colors and how bright they are 
they can tell what elements are in there and how much of each element is in there. Have you been to that lab since we were there together years ago? Um, actually, I, I went with uh, Dr. Strickland yeah. since then, but uh, but I've, I've been there probably five or six times. I really love touring. No, because that's like your heaven. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my kind of spot. So uh, they they put together a little form. Somebody says, "Oh, well, uh, you you tell them what the crop's going to be," and they look at it and they say, "Oh, well, that's the wrong thing for the crop. Here's the recommendation of what it would take to correct that soil so that it would be optimum." for whatever crop you've said. So the, this gentleman with the, the avocado trees will find out if, if he has a problem where the pH is wrong and then the plant can't absorb the nutrients or are the nutrients just not there. And if they aren't there, uh, he'll get a recommendation back on how much to apply uh, to recover the problem. And uh, like I say, ten dollars you can't beat that. Of course, you gotta pay to ship it up there, so it costs you maybe another four or five bucks for shipping. But so you have to send a check, right? Yes. So you have to possess checks. <laughs> I guess you can get a money order. <laughs> a lot of people don't possess checks anymore. I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah, boomer. A lot of people don't. <laughs> 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 checks anymore it's funny because i went years with like only using a check maybe to for a fundraiser or something like that's it but since i'm a transient person now <laughs> between living in florida and pennsylvania and all the back and forth and this tiny town in pennsylvania where i live has a borough that you have to pay once a month you know your trash and sewer bill i mean they do take credit cards, but it just seems easier sometimes to write them a check. And I pay the county for my insurance and I send a check. <laughs> you know, it's like weird. I'm writing checks lately. Almost forgot how. But so that is an issue if you to mail these, you have, there's nothing to write on the form, like to put a credit card number in or anything. I no, it, it, you have to send a check. Yeah. But, but see, I'm all okay. you can, What you can do is go to your mom, give her the money. <laughs> Have her write the check for you and send the soil test up. Well, I know. My, my belief is that if, if you've never had a soil test, you need to do it at least once so you have some idea of what a starting point is. The, the pH doesn't change very much. The, the nutrient level comes and goes as, as the, the amount of rain versus the, the amount of things that you're growing on the property. But the pH doesn't really alter that much. So so I could go and send that in and get my nitrogen tested, right? No. That, that's the one they don't test. And the reason Why? Is, that's the major thing, Bernie. Why wouldn't they test for nitrogen? There, there isn't really a good test for nitrogen that, that tells you whether the plant's going to be able to absorb it enough or not. Uh, the assumption is... If you have a plant, you need nitrogen. You always need nitrogen. There, there are very, very few plants that, that don't have to have additional nitrogen to be happy. Uh, what? The HOC Family TV. What is HOC Family TV? I don't know. Somebody's, um, it's a family who's watching this via their television or something but hello welcome <laughs> yes yeah. well welcome you yes. know if, if anybody has any questions on Fernando, anything, something maybe oh, they can tell okay. us who they are. yeah just just send your little questions in we, we, yeah, just we, still have bernie. we still have bernie so you know we can answer any question whatsoever <laughs> because the man who knows knows everything is i i want to I want to correct that. That's not true. I am not a flower person. I know nothing about flowers. I, I didn't know anything about gardening, period, when I moved to Florida. I came here. I, I did what everybody else does. I bought a bunch of plants at the big box store and watched them die. 
and and I kept doing that, and 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 I kept doing that, and and you know, if if you keep doing the same thing and expect different results, and they don't happen, that's the definition of something. I don't, you know, like being nuts. Mm -hmm. So out of desperation, I took a class and found out that there there was some scientific basis for plants. And I enjoyed that. And I took a lot of classes and I took the Master Gardener class. With me? And, and I've, I've had a ball and and I really enjoy this. And I have become very proficient at lawn questions. Uh, I'm pretty proficient at the, the technical questions. Uh, the, the soil pH and the pruning and, and all those kind of things, the, the propagation. What I can't do is identify a flower. I'm just not a flower person. So when they, they say Bernie knows everything, Bernie doesn't know diddly squat about flowers. So <laughs> if, if you have a question about flowers, the I truth might is, be able to help you. anybody but Bernie can answer it. I mean, even the simplest questions, 10 year old kids knew, know twice as much about flowers as I do. But it happens because I was, 60 years old when I started this stuff and, and had never done anything. I, I thought that, that growing a lawn was you bought a box of grass seed and you, you threw it out on the ground. And you know that works in Indiana. Yeah, probably works in Pennsylvania. It work in Florida. Yes. And, and flowers were those things that, that you went to the big box store and for uh, like 12 bucks you got this big tray with all these little compartments and you put the flowers in, they'd last a couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And then you'd go buy another box. And that was gardening to me. That was all I knew about it. So. And it looked great. So HOSA Family TV is Diana Cologne. That's the house of Cologne. And she watches it on her television because she's watching from our YouTube channel. So we're very happy to have her. And she has a question here. And even though it is uh, flower related, I think there's a word in here that you're going to catch as well as I did. We have learned so much from you all. We watched many plants and lavender die too. What's oh, I know about that. In this sentence, Bernie. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> lavender is a Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, 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 it's kind of like trying to grow palm trees in uh, Alaska. Uh, growing lavender in Florida for the exact same reason you can't do it. The, the, the climate that lavender requires is not in Florida in any way, shape, or form. So it's, and I think it's not even so much the heat as the humidity. Lavender likes a drier type. Yeah. That's why it grows so well. And it, it, well, it will survive Mediterranean climate. It won't survive. Yeah. It. Although it grows pretty well in Washington, which is pretty humid, but. Maybe it's on the other side of the mountains that isn't humid. I don't know that much about Washington. But I know people will say, well, I've done it. I mean, you can have lavender as an annual for a little bit. It's not going to be a sustainable long-term plant for you, unfortunately. Nor are tulips, nor are daffodils, nor are, you know, peonies. All these things are in my yard when I... <laughs> go home next week to Pennsylvania and <laughs> I can be happy about that because I lived 47 years here in Florida all of my adult life so now I get to you know go play with there's tulips waiting for me they've already popped up they're waiting for me a week from today I'll be saying hello to my tulips so <laughs> but here in Florida the first principle of Florida friendly landscaping is a right plant right place. It's spring here. And I'm so thrilled that I get to have two springs in my life. You know, it's the Florida spring. And it's so funny because when you first move here, you don't feel the seasons. And I guess you have to feel the seasons here because up north, they slap you in the face. <laughs> you can't miss yeah. them here. You got to be here for a while and you got to be in tune with Florida. Then you're, especially spring is very obvious. Spring is azaleas. Spring is early spring, late winter is camellias. Spring is um, blue-eyed grass. 
which don't have blue eyes and that still bothers me. Um, <laughs> the little flowers are blue, they have yellow eyes. Spring is just so many different um, flowers that grow here in Florida. We can't grow the same thing we did up north. I mean, there's some overlap. It's like a Venn chart. <laughs> there is some overlap, but that overlap, you got to put an overlap in the overlap because a lot of times it's different timing. I'll go up to Pennsylvania. They're going to wait a couple months before they even plant their petunias. Ours are going to be fading out soon. You know, it's, it's, we got a lot of questions building up. I have foxtail ferns that have only a few fronds left. Can they be brought back? That depends on a lot of things, doesn't it, Bernie? Boy, it does. And it, pot, it, yeah. Are they in a pot? Are they in the ground? Yeah. Are they in full sun? Are they in a shady area? Uh, ferns don't I, tend to do very well in full sun. That that tends to stop them. So you, know, you have some pretty big ones right outside the building there, or you do during the warmer times. How how are they doing? You're going to tell me you don't even look at them, do you? <laughs> One thing I know is we got this really big plant right on the corner of the building, firebush. And, yeah. And it attacks me every I time I that. walk around the corner of the building. So. And the butterflies probably attack you too, right? We have learned I, I, I have never that said Bernie that. has some childhood butterfly I, trauma. I, I made that up. That was a lie. Maybe. I should have said that. And that's a, you know, and he's denying, I got caught. You know, this is typical, you know, traumatic behavior. He has some shadow work to address regarding this butterfly attack when he was a child. <laughs> All right. Um, the only thing I could say, David, is, you know, try it. If, it, if they look dead, um, maybe wait a week or two. Make sure it's, because they're pretty cold sensitive, aren't they, Bernie? I'm um, not specific on the foxtail, but uh, I, I, you know, ferns don't propagate in the normal. No, way. they send out spores. Right. So I mean, the spores generate, and then this, the that there there is a a, 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 a sexual portion in the the generation, but uh, I I would tend to think that the the ferns can be brought back, but the, uh, the, the specific thing they need is their exact living conditions. Right. Um, they need to be in some shade. Um, if they're pot bound, maybe put them in a bigger pot um, and then see what happens. What have you got to lose? Uh, <laughs> maybe Teresa can get us something on uh, foxtail ferns. Fox fern. She might be involved in that. Yeah. She might be involved in that thing that Bill's in. Mm. No. A uh, Facebook user has a soil test that they purchased at a hardware store. Are those? Yeah, I can answer that possible? one. Go ahead. Absolutely, positively, without a shadow of a doubt, worthless. <laughs> um, Why don't you say what you really mean, Bernie? <laughs> the, the extension office over in Sumter County used to, used to be tied in we had the same director uh, and Up until they like decided to do uh ph tests at, at the office there so they they got one of the little sample kits one of the one of the little uh hardware type ph mm -hmm. testers mm -hmm. and and they could test the same sample three or four times and get different numbers so they, they realized that that was a problem so they bought one of the higher quality actual pH test kits. They could not consistently come within one pH unit of what the university was was sending out. Yeah. So uh, if, if you, you know, it, it'll tell you the, the cheap kit that you get a hardware store will tell you basically if you're acid or, or basic. But piece of litmus paper would do that. But as far as as being uh, an accurate test, uh, for instance, if, if you want to grow bahia grass, 
and, and you have a high pH, you, you have a pH seven and a half or more, there's just no possible way. But hey, I wants to be at 5.5. So if you get a test kit, you're, you're at seven. The test kit says that you're 6.2. You're going to say, hey, man, this thing will really work great. Well, the truth is you could barely do it. And yet your kit said that everything was going to be fine. So mm -hmm. uh, as, as far as a, a general test to tell you, one, do I have a high or low potassium content? They do that. Do I have high or low phosphorus? They'll do that. Do I have an acid or a, a basic pH? They'll do that. But to give you numbers that are meaningful, they will not do that. That, that's something that's very, very difficult. That's kind of bringing me along since we're talking about lawns and pH and all that. We run into this every spring from our newbies, our new residents here in Florida. And usually they do it first and ask questions later. Bernie, should I apply lime to my lawn to sweeten it like I did in rochester or wherever i came from boy that that is a tough one um if, if you have grass in your lawn and you have florida soil underneath the grass the absolute last thing you would ever want to put down is lime uh, and i you know i've done this now over 20 years and one time I had a legitimate place where you should have put lime down on soil, on, on the lawn. Wow. wow. I'm surprised you're doing that. And, and it, it surprised me because I, I have always said under no circumstances should you ever use lime. And about six months ago, I had somebody with a 5.1 pH. Where were they located? I don't remember. And and they had a St. Augustine lawn. And maybe they were in a pine forest or something. Yeah, yeah it, it was that kind of a deal. They, they were on the edge of, of a pine forest. I'm thinking they were, yeah, on the edge of the Withlacoochee forest, something. And uh, I, I told them, I said, you know, I, I, this is it. This is the only time I've ever seen a, a, a legitimate lime recommendation. But that's not, you know, under under well, normal I'm, circumstances, I'm you would never, after. never yeah. lime. You know, if, if you live in a in a subdivision uh, or in an area that that is not completely full of pine trees, uh, I can't imagine that that you would ever see a situation where you should use lime. If you have bahia grass, you should never, ever use lime on bahia grass. There, there's no place I know of in Florida where the pH is so low that bahia would not be happy uh, or would be happier if you limed it. So that's my recommendation. I'm glad that happened um, to you. And after I retired, because if you look back on some of my videos, I have actually, you know, sent out a challenge that if you get a soil test back that says you need to lime it, I will eat a bug. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I can find that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happened to you, not to me. So, <laughs> And, you know, I guess I could, we could push it if we needed to. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped over this one. Uh, Diana has mimosa. I assume she means sunshine mimosa. Starting to grow. Mimosa strigolosa, yes. That, you know, native plant people love to say the Latin names. Bernie and I just like to say the fun Latin names. <laughs> so, Mimosa strigolosa and perennial peanut. What's that Latin name? Ha! You know, do you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Corey does. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like Latin names are for me. If I see the Latin name, I know what plant it's talking about. I know the common name if I see the Latin name. But to ask me the Latin name, I know about maybe 10. That might be <laughs> pushing it. 
because the people I taught when I was working, uh, you know, they were like, stop throwing Latin names at us. We don't care. We just want to know, you know, what the plants are. We want something easy to understand. Where Latin names come into play is if you work in a nursery, obviously you got to know what to order. The other time it comes into play is if it's important to know one from the other, like Camellia patens. Do you know what that is? Bernie, mm. oh. <laughs> you were just talking about it. That is the native firebush. So it's important if you, because the native firebush and the non-native firebush are hard to tell apart in the nursery. And the non-native one doesn't attract near the amount of butterflies. You know, so you're not getting what you want out of the native one. So if you look at the tag and it says Hamelia patens, <sighs> chances are, I don't want to say, you know, you're getting the native one because then again, the hybrid hybridization has occurred. And, you know, so sometimes it's almost impossible to tell, but you that know, is one of the, the best forth. hummingbird plants. Absolutely. If, if you want hummers, that is a great, great plant. It is so easy to grow and it'll freeze back and come back. And if you're in South Florida, it won't freeze back and it'll get huge. If, and you know, if it freezes back in in uh, mid-January, just go in and clean it off to the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be frozen to the ground by then, usually. Yeah. <laughs> but just, well, the, the problem is you don't lose them all. You know, unless you get a, a really good freeze. Right. Uh, and we didn't, we haven't had any good freezes for a few years. And if, if I remember right, my fire bush would, it puts out new growth every year. It's not really going to grow on the old growth. So as Bernie said, go ahead and cut it back, cut it back. And then by summer, you'll have a nice big bushy bush that your hummingbirds will come to but only early in the morning when your husband who isn't working can see them and you were still working and you can't see them. But anyway, <laughs> and tons and tons and tons of sulfur butterflies and bees. And they just love it. And it's really- And I like the perennial peanut. That That is a, a real nice replacement plant for grass. So is sunshine mimosa. We didn't discuss that, what that really is. Diana's not, you know, She's not morning drinking. She's talking about a plant um, that it's in the sensitive plant family. You know, it, it closes up kind of if you touch it or wind blows or anything. And it puts out these pink powder puff balls. It makes a great ground cover. Now it, it comes with its controversy. It becomes, um, what's the word I want? Invasive. It, no. Spreads like crazy. If, <laughs> That's if not what I was not it's looking for. Run all over your neighbor's yard, but it you know, I love it. I think it's beautiful. And all little puff balls. You know, it depends if if you have a lot of area that you want to cover, put down the sunshine mimosa. I know the master gardeners at the nursery think sunshine mimosa is a bad word. And it's because they wanted to put something else in this particular bed. And Sunshine Mimosa wanted to be the queen of the entire bed. And it would be, you know, created a difficult situation for them. So I would say if you want it, make sure you can have it where it can. Enthusiastic. That's a word. That's a good word. It's an enthusiastic yeah. grower. It that, um, like crazy. Now, me in the Royal Highlands where I used to live. I couldn't get it to grow. I couldn't get it to do much of anything. My people who bought my house, maybe in a few years, they're going to be just as mad as the master gardeners at me. I don't know, but I couldn't get it to do. It wasn't enthusiastic at all for me, but it's a great plant. We, there's a, a former master gardener who's a native plant expert who uses it as a lawn. Does great. Are there some recommendations for native landscape low maintenance? We just told you some. Um, Sunshine Mimosa is a ground cover. 
that fire bush. Make sure you get Hamelia patens, H-A-M-I-A-P-A-T-E-N-S. Amelia patens for if you want, make sure you get the native. Ah, uh, beauty berry. I love beauty berry. I never bought a beauty berry in my life. You can. You can go to native plant sales. You can go to the master gardener um, plant nursery and buy beauty berry. I never had to because they were growing naturally all over my yard and I would just relocate them. Beauty berry is a plant. But the only thing I have against it is they do not grow symmetrical. So no. if, you have, if you have them as a specimen plant, they aren't pretty. If you have them as a little grow, uh, they're really neat I because the, mine pretty. Mine the, the berries pretty. are pretty and, and the plant looks good. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, trimmed mine. They looked pretty good, actually. I've told this story a hundred times about I put a beauty berry um, and I drug it out of my wooded lot and put it right in front of my house over the septic tank <laughs> and by a window and it grew very enthusiastically. And I decided it wasn't a good place for it there in front of the house. I was having to prune it all the time. And so I cut it back some. And then I decided, you know, I'm going to dig you out. So I got a shovel and I'm shoveling and I'm shoveling. And then me and the bush are dancing and dancing. It turned into a royal rumble. We were out there just <laughs> and I finally had to go get an axe to its roots <laughs> to pull that thing out having the royal rumble with this bush in my yard <laughs> and i arose the victor put it over my shoulder <laughs> planted it in the backyard you know is any plant going to survive that beauty berry is it went fine i'll grow right here you know <laughs> it is such a tough good plant other native plants are um, beach sunflower or dune sunflower. That one is like a three foot tall kind of ground cover, has pretty happy little yellow flowers. That one is has become so incredibly hybridized with a, there's a West Coast um, beach sunflower and there's an East Coast beach sunflower. Native plant people used to always tell me, well, be careful, you don't get the East Coast one. And I used to be like, okay, you know, that's very specific. And then I realized what they were saying was the East Coast one is not native. But then I did more research into it and they, there's no way to, over time and over human intervention, they have melded into each other. So just do the best you can do. Put forth the best effort. I had that sunshine mimosa in front of my house for 15 years, you know, and it looked great. It gets a little enthusiastic. It wants to grow where nothing else wants to grow. It's called beach sunflower, dune sunflower. The cruddiest place you have in your yard, <laughs> the hottest and sandiest and ickiest, that's where it wants to grow. So it would grow over the sidewalk because it preferred that to the the bed and I would have to cut it like two or three times a year off of the sidewalk. Um, what are some other? Mm -hmm. Another neat plant that gets overlooked, I think, is East, East Platka Holly. Uh, yeah, I love those. And that's a native hybrid. And some people get prickly about that, but it is a very nice plant. Well, I, I think it's a native. They found it in East Platka. It, it's only in one sex, so it, it uh, you know, you you can't have a, a male and a female East Black Holly. You can only have females. So. Yeah. So and I think it is a cross. I, I will have to look it up. I think anything that has an X in it, you know, it's been a hybrid with something. So it depends on how pure you want to get, you know, with a native thing. I say right plant, right place. And there are plenty of great hybrids. There are plenty of great well-behaved uh, exotic plants as well. Um, ground partial sun, they do take a lot of water. Uh, that's the, was that the foxtails that Dave was talking about? 
yeah, maybe put them in a little bit more shade so they don't, you know, need as much water. They might be happier there. Corey's laughing at us. Who knows why? <laughs> <laughs> We're hilarious, Bernie. Here is our background producer, always helping out. Teresa, maybe it was Bill, but it was probably Teresa, put up the Foxtail Fern publication. And as Bernie always tells you, don't try to sit there and memorize this. edis.ifis.ufl.edu slash publication slash FBO52. Uh, you know what's a whole lot easier? Fox Till Fern UF. It'll bring that one right up. Oh, now, yeah, now he's sneaking in here. Or, oh no, this is Colby. Yeah. Colby. Sorry I couldn't be there today. I did get a great question from a customer today. They have poor drainage under some oak trees with not much sun. Azaleas didn't work for them. What would be a good plant for this situation? Carolina jasmine. Okay. I would say the only reason azaleas didn't work is the root structure maybe of the trees. Probably a drainage problem. Yeah. Yeah. And that compact soil because azaleas love to be under oak trees but you still have to have the right conditions um yeah or yeah. mulch <laughs> jasmine you're right jasmine would do very well and it will become enthusiastic i like that word we're going to keep using that <laughs> um you'll have with your weed trimmer you know you can keep it contained where you want it to be just be careful that it doesn't start going up the tree but um, some gingers might work. You want to look for something more shallow rooted because obviously the azaleas didn't work because it became a competition. So caladiums could be an annual to put there. I'm um, trying to think of other shade loving impatience. You know, they'll freeze, but they'll probably come, they come back at least two or three years, the third year, they start getting really scraggly. Well, really ads would be great, but your mosquito people aren't going to like you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bernie loves his bromeliads. Her I do. I think bromeliads are one of the nicest plants going. So that shows Unless you what I am as far as a, a flower person. Yeah. <laughs> You're a no flower flower person. Hey, they, they have got the most beautiful flowers. If, if, if you, ever get some of these really pretty flowering bromeliads. I mean, they have spikes with the multi colors and, and just, they're gorgeous. I mean, it, it's not just a, a little bloom like a rose or something. These mm -hmm. are things that- Intricate. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's a good word. I like that intricate. Mm -hmm. Or maybe um, some little mounded dwarf yopon hollies if you're not looking for flowers you know just to but they might fight with the roots as well so that would be my suggestion is something shallow rooted that isn't going to you know shade loving shallow rooted so look for perennials that, that's not a bush you know that um are shade loving to try and put under there Let's see what else we have. Um, ah, there's a blog about adding lime to your grass, as in not adding lime to your grass that Teresa put up there for us from looks like Nassau County wrote about it. Dave, thanks you for the foxtail fern info. And we get smiley faces from Diana. Oh, what do we have here? Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> Facebook user is giving us the Latin name for perennial peanut. I assume this is probably a master gardener, whoever this Facebook user is. Um, <laughs> um, and several other perennial species of peanuts, which are relatives of the nut producing peanut, Acarus hypogea. They were introduced to the United States from South America starting in the 1930s. Perennial peanut is not a peanut that you can eat. 
It is an ornamental ground cover. If you want to see some, wait a couple months and drive down Spring Hill Drive right around Cast Circle where there's those little old medians there. At least they used to, unless they've taken it out for some reason. That used to be filled with perennial peanut. And I believe the Master Gardener Nursery still has some, don't they, Bernie? Yeah, they, they have a, a small quantity. You know, that, that is sold in bigger quantities as EcoTurf. Yep. And uh, it's it's a fine product. It, it has a, a nine-month uh, run where it... it is a, a good looking product it if you don't mind the fact that it, it, it does get damaged uh in the cold, cold. It, it, it looks like dead lettuce thick. yeah it looks like dead lettuce out there during the winter but and i wouldn't say it's going to create a lawn that you can gamble in <laughs> and i mean like lambs gambling not like playing poker on your yeah. <laughs> it you're not going to walk barefoot on it uh it's not you know nice lawn that you can have a picnic and roll around in but um same with sunshine mimosa it's a ground cover but it's not a walk through barefoot kind of thing the the funny part about it is this this thing that a lawn has to be monoculture and and right. all one thing most of us that have moved to florida in retirement are old enough that we definitely remember four leaf clovers and and going out and and doing things in the lawn as a kid and when you stop and think back about it there wasn't any monoculture grass no that 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 was dandelions were the, okay yeah yeah that that is something that was put in our minds by the advertising community and it, one of the most successful uh brainwash jobs done to, to the american citizens ever because every guy now believes if he can't have a perfectly green lawn all monoculture and no weeds that he's a failure and of course my job is to convince him it's a failure so he'll come and listen. Sure, that's to not marketing is supposed to do. You know, it yeah. tells every woman that she's fat and needs, you know, to, you know, buy this and do that and the other. And it tells every man he's not a real man if he doesn't have a perfect lawn. <laughs> you know? yeah, it's really sad. I, I, I really miss the, the, the lawns where you could go out and find a clover or, and, and there are some clovers that'll grow here. Uh, but, very few people ever ever even think about using a clover as a lawn, but there is a white clover that, that grows here. Yeah. And there's false dandelions too. Yeah. Here's a publication on the firebush that uh, Teresa has snuck on here. That's so a again, great plant. Yeah, it is. It's so easy <laughs> to do and it, it takes care of itself. Diana is, she wants the Sunshine Mimosa to take over. She's close to the Royal Highlands. You know, the, it's so many microclimates out there that you get closer, like on the east side of Sunshine Grove Road, you're getting a little more uh, loamy, if that's a good word, you know, more substance in your soil, more oak trees and stuff than you are closer to, to 19. So, and it could have just been my yard. I don't know why it wouldn't take off. I couldn't get, I told Bernie this, I couldn't get, um, what's wrong with me, passion vine to grow. And it's not that it wouldn't grow. It would only get this big and it'd start maybe get that big. And then boom, it was down to that big because I found out gopher tortoises like to eat passion <laughs> vine so even though i was missing my passion vine growing on my fence like it did when i lived in brooksville itself i mean like a mile from the courthouse in brooksville um i knew i was at least making that gopher tortoise happy so <laughs> if your yard is not feeding something you just don't have the right kind of yard so it's not going to look perfect 
it's not if your yard looks perfect you are not helping the environment how's that for your you're probably cheating on water for one thing <laughs> yes yes beach sunflower is what it's called or it's sometimes it's called dune sunflower it's the same thing perhaps um teresa can find it's about two foot tall yellow yeah. flowers pretty plant nice plant mm -hmm. and here's another um, on orange county fact sheet about native plants we're pretty close to orange county we can plant the same plants a lot of times Dave has pine timber that was allowed to grow wild for 30 years, covered in vines. What is the best way to get a crop cover to edge out the weeds in the long term? Mow it. <laughs> Say, Bernard, this is your <laughs> question. Well, it, it, uh, assuming that it's some acreage and it isn't, a land, isn't lawn, uh, I'd, I'd go after the vines probably with, um, I can't think of the name of it, begins with uh, Milestone. Milestone is one of the few uh, products that's, that's successful on skunk vine and on uh, the... <laughs> I love it. I have, having one of those senior days. Oh, potato vine. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really work much on the potato vine. Uh, green briar, green briar, green, not green briar. The the one that looks like poison ivy, the, the little Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper. There you go. <laughs> that the problem, Virginia creeper. If if you've got any in the the lawn, it's all over the place. And and because it, it is a vine, as it grows along the ground, uh, it it goes a foot. It produces a node produces some roots and goes another foot and and you can only kill it back to the that node with with something like roundup so uh you you have a, an eight foot vine with 40 nodes that's still left out there that that little vine will just keep coming back so you need to get rid of the vines uh and a lot of the other plants a uh, milestone will do that. Milestone absolutely is not approved for lawns. You cannot use it for lawns. I, I cannot overemphasize that. But mow it first, right? And then. But I would mow it first. Mm -hmm. And then depends on, on how uh, dense the, the uh, trees are, how much, what, what you have for lighting uh, as, as to what you can put down. And, and uh, the, the thing that's going to happen is, is the milestone is going to clean up most of it. Uh, there, there's some native things that uh, will probably work in there. Um, actually, they're pro that's probably a good spot to put in some natives. Uh, mm -hmm. Little wiregrass clumps. Wiregrass is what I was thinking of. They love would, to be with be nice. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's one of those things, once you clean up the vines, a lot of that other stuff pretty much takes care of itself. The, mm -hmm. the, the vines are a serious problem. So right. I would, yeah. I would mow it. And, it and it's not going to happen one time. That's no. the thing. It's a continual effort. Diana says, thank you, and we are fun. <laughs> she also says hi to Colby. Hi, Colby. <laughs> Apparently neighbors just walked by. Uh, they were good for 49 minutes. I mean, that's pretty good. Um, Teresa's sending us 22 ideas for a low care, low cost landscape. So you can look that up. The University of Florida has thousands of publications out there. They're fantastic. That is your best resource. Um, what kind of jasmine? Did you say Asiatic or you said Confederate? Either yeah. one. Either one would do well. Asiatic is going to be a little shorter and denser. Confederate will grow in a bit, little bit longer. Space. Asiatic is is nice as just a real low growing ground cover. That yeah. that does beautiful underneath an oak tree. I like that. 
Okay. So we changed our minds to Asiatic. <laughs> Jasmine. I like so both. But, but Asiatic does stay down nice. It, it stays nice and low. It's not going to give you any Jasmine fragrance, though. No. But it'll stay dark, dark, dark green all year. Mm -hmm. Look really good. Uh, here we have our producer, uh, <laughs> Teresa, um, giving us a cover crop publication. Again, from the University of Florida. What this stands for is... That's pasture type ground yeah. cover, if I remember right. Well, agriculture cover crop. So she was speaking to the gentleman who had the pine forest, maybe. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's probably going to cover pine forest. They've seen some while driving around. I've lost track of cutting? Jasmine, hey, maybe? Always take cuttings. You know, if they don't work, you're not out anything. And if they do work, you got a free plant. Well, I don't take cuttings story. from the roadside flocks because you will be arrested. I uh, <laughs> protected wildflowers. I, it's I, nice I, to I look. took a group of master gardeners and we went to... Um, Lou Gardens over in Orlando. And I was kind of embarrassed because a couple of the guys took some plastic bags and scissors and, and took oh. cuttings in an area where they probably shouldn't have done it. And uh, the, the head of Lou Gardens gave a, a speech and he said, I've been thrown out of more of these places than you can imagine. He said, I always take my little plastic bags. And if there's something I like, I take cuttings. He said, any place you go and there's a plant you need, he said, just take a cutting. And I thought, you shouldn't be telling people that. So yeah, I'm not yeah. telling you that. And but, a cutting and a cutting is this big, by the way. A cutting is not. Now, don't take a limb. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did that. Nobody's recently. gonna miss a, a, a the, leaf the, or a, a little the cutting. Piece. I most recently took was from one of my mother's Swedish ivies, but she's been gone for since '08. But I had already, you know, some of her babies of her Swedish ivies. Well, remember I moved, so <laughs> I gave one of those to my daughter here in. Florida. And when I went by her house to uh, pick up some mail the other day, I'm just like, hmm, here's another piece of that <laughs> Swedish ivy again. That was my mother's and mine, and I reappropriated some of it, and now I have it growing in a tiny little pot. I'll be leaving again, so I'll see if it can make the trip. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, I know where I can get more. But see, that's the only cutting taking I did was actually from what was originally my own plant. Uh, Colby's telling us the banks on the main loop at the Wellington have lots of perennial peanut, and that is a great implementation of that plant. So there's another place if you, where you can go and check out what it looks like. Teresa's giving us landscaping for shade. There we go. I mean, UF just has the answer for everything. Also a publication on white clover. How does she do this this fast? She's got super duper fingers. Well, she's sitting in there thinking, what are these idiots going to come up with next? I'm amazed <laughs> that she does that. And this is entirely unscripted, completely unscripted. She sits there and she listens. She hears a word and she's, she's on it. Ground covers for shade. And if you, you know, would like these links sent to you, email Bill. I'll show you his email in a little bit. And he might forward it on to Teresa. I think hers is twegglers at ufl.edu if you wanted to directly ask Teresa for these links. There it is. The debilish <laughs> is, um, helianthus is the beach sunflower. So uh, Dave thanks you for the Pine lot answer will research potato vine and clump grass cover. You don't want to put in potato vine, uh, Dave. We, no, 
didn't mean to say that if we accidentally did. The potato vine is a horrible <laughs> invasive vine. If you have it, you're trying to get rid of it. You got to, aside from taking care of the vines, you have to pick up all those potatoes. And if wherever you are, if they don't have a um, potato vine beetle program going on, email Bill about that and he can hopefully, he's got the right contacts at the university, maybe to re release some in your area because they're very helpful with that. You know, there, there's a beetle that is controlling potato vine. It's not eliminating yes. it, but it's controlling it. Exactly. If, if you want to eliminate it, it's one of those things where you have to cut the vine, uh, you, you know, at about three feet, you paint the three feet of remaining vine with garland, which will work into the, to the system and, and be a systemic yeah. killing. And then yeah. you have to get all the potatoes. Well, it's going to take you hours of hours of, of work and it's going to take you three years to get them all. So, uh, can um, just, regular citizens have that problem? Regular citizens can buy that. What garland? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was almost said can humans buy that? <laughs> garland is the uh, triclopyr. Uh, yes. Chemical. Don't go. Don't go into highway medians and uh, get a cutting. And I was serious about the highway flocks. Gosh, they're gorgeous this year, aren't they, Bernie? Have you noticed? I mean, even yeah, you, they're, have they're seen. just now coming out really pretty. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. that's 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 the if, purple. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take cuttings, you know, you have to have a little common sense. There are places where it's obviously illegal to do anything. You cannot go on government property and you can't and go on start hacking away. Permission either. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and you, oh, she had a fangirl moment. She got to meet Dr. Lester at <laughs> Tavares. Well, I'm sure he was very happy to meet one of his biggest fans. Um, here's another publication on invasive vines. And um, Dave says, great info. Thanks. T Teresa is great. She is. She runs this whole thing. You know that. Yeah. She does. She's the brains behind the operation. In fact, behind she's probably the only brains in the building. But other than that, you know. Oh, Dave says potato vine is his problem. Yeah. Um, Where do you live, Dave? Because um, if you live around here, we do have potato beetles, air potato beetles in our area. And they're not going to really start. You're not going to see their work till end Mid, of June. late Ju Ju july yeah. yeah and then you will see the leaves be have holes all through them what they're doing now is they're starting to wake up and they're starting to look at their partners amorously and <laughs> they're starting to be like hey why don't we start a family so <laughs> that's what's happening now because it's spring and then um when the babies grow up a little, that's what they're going to do mid to late June. Start eating holes in your air potato uh, leaves, and then they will skeletonize them, basically, and greatly reduce uh, the vines. As Bernie says, they're not going to eradicate them. Why would a species eradicate their baby's food? So <laughs> they're going to, but they, they have helped tremendously. So we're almost running out of time. We still have questions. Um, Susan says she has many times searched for people wanting English ivy for the long, dramatic interior wall or high shelf to cathedral type ceilings. She remembers seeing it used that way. And she has a free 12 to 20 foot uh, long if anyone wants to hang it inside. English ivy is pretty... Uh, invasive as well maybe not so much in florida but up north it's considered a um you know a, well, on one of the high lists of invasive plants and i can tell you that from experience now we bought this house in pennsylvania the lady who lived there was she at one time had a beautiful yard 
but she wasn't able to get out of the house for 15 years. So I can tell you, um, English Ivy is <laughs> going to be one of my nemesis because <laughs> it's, it's, it's everywhere. That and trumpet vine. So one of those cases where when humans interfere, a native plant can become invasive. It's definitely what's happened there. And honeysuckle, and she has bamboo. So we're just going to go home and like take everything down and, you know, start all over again. So is pine bark best for mulching around the base of shrubs? It's, I don't know if it's best, but it is good. It's a great it's, one. It's my favorite mulch. Yeah, me too. Uh, I really like pine bark. Ed. I like the big chunky ones because they last a long time and that's cost effective. <laughs> and the, and uh, the stay down powdery to stuff becomes a really good organic material in the soil really quick. It, this stuff lasts, the, the big chunks last a long time. The rest of it disappears pretty quick, but it, it's a, a, a great mulch, makes a great half mulch so and it, it's relatively inexpensive by the way potting soil with pine bark is um uh, as its basis works better for most people than the ones with sphagnum moss because sphagnum moss if it dries out it's yeah. very very difficult to get re-wetted i've never had any luck with that yeah and and it's it's so much easier to work with pine bark mulch. Uh, um, I don't know if I probably shouldn't mention the name Jungle Grow because I'm not supposed to mention product names. But uh, I the jury will disregard that statement. <laughs> yeah, but that that mulch is is based on pine bark instead of uh, sphagnum moss. Okay. Diana, um, it's it, it, it's pH. Yep, I just wrote it in there. Um, pH LOX. When you go out driving anywhere <laughs> this time of year, go down or east on 50, go, go east on 50, go towards the interstate, it'll knock your socks off. Um, these beautiful purple, pink, and some white flowers. They are pH LOX flocks. Um, the one, there are native flocks. What you see on the side of the road are not native. They are the Texas um, cousins because they are going to do better as far as what we want for them that widespread, incredible carpet look. So part of originally it started out as part of the um, Lady Bird Johnson wildflower road roadside wildflower program, and um, they are protected wildflowers. Even though they are non-native Texas cousins, they are Phlox dramundi. See, I remember that native name. Um, I am so in love with them. Um, I have some pictures I took of them. They are fantastic. And um, I guess the statute of limitations has, um, you know, expired. So I can tell you, I was young. <laughs> oh, no. Very, very young. Getting married. And I did not know any better. And, you know, we didn't have much money or anything. So I, the day before my wedding, went and picked a bouquet <laughs> of flocks. That was where my was my bouquet. Don't do that. I know better now. Um, but so that's what I think of when I see the flocks. Aside from the gorgeousness, you don't even have to go all the way east if you live in there, Spring Hill. Go up 19. Go towards Wikiwachi High School. You'll see them. There is a special program to get wildflower seeds. Yes, thank you. I was going to bring that up. And I bet you Teresa can give us that link. The Florida Wildflower Cooperative. If you look that up, you can buy the seeds so that you can maybe, you know, have them in your yard where you want them. We're running over, but Dave is in Sumter County with his pine forest. So, you know, everything we told you will still make yeah. have a good effect. 
Um, what do we have here? Control of air potato. Anne Marie says blueberries love pine bark. They don't just love it. They need it <laughs> because if you're going to try to grow blueberries, you're going to have to have them in a pot or in a big mound. And it'd be almost entirely pine bark because they need a, like a what? Four something pH. They, they need around five. So, okay. Choosing and installing mulches. And if you go to, go to, um, Fernando County government, YouTube, you will, I'm trying to, what am I doing here? Uh, you will see, uh, if you go to Florida friendly landscaping, you'll see a whole bunch of, um, videos that will, some of them are about mulch and also on Hernando County um, Extensions YouTube, which is in the same place under Hernando County Government YouTube. From a I purely see. ecological standpoint, cedar uh, mulch is pro or cypress mulch is probably the worst because they just chop down the cypress trees and turn them into mulch. Um, by the same token, eucalyptus mulch, which has probably the best insect uh, retardant, is the, the finest mulch because the eucalyptus trees are a real pain and we want them cut down and turned into mulch. So um, if eucalyptus mulch is available and you want something that's ecologically friendly, eucalyptus mulch is the way to go. Uh, never buy cypress mulch because no. they're ruining all the cypress forests. In fact, some of the uh, mulch companies have promised now not to use any trees south of Interstate 10 because all the trees south of Interstate 10 have pretty well been decimated now. And Yes, uh, yeah, that, the cypress mulch won't hurt your yard. It hurts the environment when you purchase cypress mulch. The, the eucalyptus mulch has, and this, the, when they tell you that, that these mulches are termite resistant, they're not very resistant, but eucalyptus mulch is the most resistant, which probably means it discourages one out of a thousand termites. Yeah. But yeah. Putting mulch right up against your house is an invitation to termites. Melaleuca mulch is also, um, a good thing. And that's what I meant. Melaleuca mulch. Melaleuca yes. is the treats we want to get rid of. So buy yeah. melaleuca. Get the, the melaleuca. Eucalyptus is fine too. They grow the eucalyptus trees on um, sustainable right. branches, just like pine. But melaleuca is, yeah, what you were referring to is the punk tree from South Florida. So it's a good idea to get rid of them, use them for something functional. And they may, they do make a great mulch and they do have a little bit longer of termite resistance than maybe some of the others. We are now, running. Melaleuca trees uh, really consume the water. So they, they put in all the trees to dry up the swamp. And actually, we're better off to keep the swamp. Uh, it maintains the environment. So Absolutely. Uh, we, have, we have destroyed the environment here. So uh, buying Melaleuca mulch improves our environment. Thank you. Yes. Teresa says, help save our beautiful and environmentally valuable native cypress. Spread the word and spread the right kinds of mulch. I think that is a very good uh, statement to end with since we're running over time. See, Bernie, we do a great job. I think there should be a spinoff of the virtual plant clinic called the Lily and Bernie Show. What do you think? <laughs> the, the Bernie and Lily Show. We'll do that. <laughs> And before we go, I just go ahead. I was going to say I want to thank the uh, people that uh, responded. It, the the yeah. more re response we get from the audience, the better the program goes. Yeah, because we and, can and sit it around. Was very very good today. I appreciate it. Thank you. We can sit around and talk to each other anytime. We need your input for this <laughs> program to work, and we thank you. Yes, thank you always to Teresa. I want to share this before we go. It's not showing up, is it? No. Well, never mind then. <laughs>
Why isn't it showing up now? Because Bill moved it. Oh, well. It's a, it was a picture of... <laughs> I better stop playing with <laughs> it. It's a picture of a bunch of baby lubber uh, grasshoppers all over a big clump of Spanish moss. It's just something I hadn't seen before. They really liked it. I would not have noticed it if my puppy didn't notice it. He wanted to eat the lovers. Um, so, but speaking of, of my puppy, he's been so good eating this Easter ham bone that I luckily had here. So, and now he's looking at me like he wants to go outside and we're running overtime. So with that, um, I for sure will not be able to be here next week. I'll be on the road, but I'm sure Bernie will be here. And perhaps we can get Colby back in some manner, even if he has to come over to your office. And um, maybe we'll even have Dr. Lester for Dr. Lester's virtual <laughs> plant clinic. He's turning into Johnny Carson here, isn't he, Bernie? <laughs> he's not here more than he's here. <laughs> he's a busy, busy man. He's very busy. All right. It's good to see you, Bernie. It's been and a pleasure, Lily. Yes. Thank you, everybody. I had a great time. <laughs>